Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin, went to great lengths to conceal their identity. Many articles have been written about who this person is, but as of 2021, after more than a decade, the identity of Satoshi is still unknown. I used to be astounded that Satoshi was anonymous, that someone could create something of value and not want to take any credit for it. But people use pseudonyms for a lot of reasons. If you want the work to speak for itself, a lot of authors have written books under fake names. Musicians have done it in more sexist periods of human history. Women would use pseudonyms to avoid political issues. And since Satoshi's Bitcoin, we have seen Crypto Note by Nicholas von Saberhagen, Mimble Wimble by Tom Elvis Chidusor, and The Avalanche Consensus by Team Rocket. All of these are pseudonyms. These are not real names, and they're mysteries for another day. But with Satoshi going silent in 2011, it's interesting to think, could Satoshi still be creating things under a different name? Producing new ideas and innovations, working on other projects. If the premise is that Satoshi is still alive, well, then you have to imagine they're working on something. So today, we'll take a look at a man who is working in the space, a 30-something-year-old named Sergei Nazarov, and look at the theory that Sergei could be the man behind Satoshi. And we are talking about Bitcoin and Bitcoin. Welcome. Satoshi Nakamoto consists of about 500 public messages, a few dozen emails, a few hundred code commits, and not much else. Whoever it was, they obviously did an excellent job in not leaving behind any evidence that might connect this work to a real identity. But they were not a god. I don't think this is an artificial intelligence or an alien. It was a person. Many narratives make it seem like Bitcoin came out of nowhere, but digital money was something that was really being worked on since the 1990s. It doesn't often get mentioned, but failed attempts like Liberty Reserve laid the groundwork for Bitcoin. Liberty Reserve was not successful because, well, it was breaking some laws, but also because it was not decentralized. They had central points of failure. They had a CEO to track down. They had a physical office. So even though it was in Costa Rica, the US was able to crack them and destroy it. Cypherpunks were trying to create digital money without a centralized point of failure. And Satoshi delivered. Given that it was this legal gray area, it makes sense that they would want to be private. They knew enough to be cautious, and they knew enough about computer science to code. And they knew enough about money to understand what was wrong with the current systems in place. Sergei's parents moved from Russia to New York in the 1990s. They were both engineers. Sergei has said at five years old, he remembers sitting in front of his first keyboard, and that started this career path of working with technology, leading up to the present, working on cryptocurrency. Sergei is most known for leading the Chainlink 
initial coin offering in 2017. And Chainlink is currently ranked seven on CoinMarketCap. Going from less than a dollar to over 20 in just a few years. A lot of projects have made it into the top 10 only to later become worthless. So I'm not telling you Chainlink is here to stay and I'm definitely not telling you it's more important than Bitcoin, but it does have a very passionate fan base. Certain message boards were obsessed with it in 2017, doing more work than any professional marketing team could to bring awareness and get people involved. There's a lot of these I won't share as they are not appropriate. Here's a popular showing of military rank, depending on how much chain link you own. That's where the phrase link marine comes from. A little insane, uh, but the more the price increases, the more compelling these memes become. And that's part of the allure and the problem of altcoins. Something that is worth nothing that can suddenly make you rich. So, but, but these big price movements didn't just happen from people seeing memes and throwing some money in. It's coming from somewhere else. So that begs the question, do big investors know something? Satoshi deserves a lot of credit for the Bitcoin white paper, but in a sneaky way, setting up the Bitcoin talk forums was just as, if not more important for the success of Bitcoin. Bitcoin wasn't and isn't just a technology experiment. It's a social experiment and it needs people. It needs users for it to work. Satoshi fostering early adoption in 2009, 10, and 11 by creating a community is a big reason why it is successful today. Satoshi's communications were always in clear English, British English spelling, but while the Bitcoin Talk Forum was started in English by Satoshi, the very first non-English section was Russian. Worth noting that there was an effort to show Bitcoin to a Russian audience when I can think of a few other countries in Asia that might be interested. We know Sergey owns smartcontract.com. If you visit it now, it actually redirects you to the Chainlink Labs website. I'm sure he owns a bunch of domain names, but this one in particular is interesting. Smart contract is a term that means exactly what it sounds like, a contract that executes on its own. When this happens, then this happens. Might sound simple, but to do this in a trusted, neutral, and decentralized way is proven to be quite a difficult problem to solve. Smart contract and Bitcoin have this kind of shared history. Uh, same with Chainlink for that matter. And it raises some eyebrows to see that smartcontract.com was registered October 25th, 2008. That's six days before Satoshi shared the Bitcoin white paper. The timing, well, it's incredible. And it laid dormant after that for a while. It wasn't until 2014 when a transfer occurred and Sergey was officially listed as the owner. Using the Wayback Machine back to 2014, we can see that Sergey actually did use it for his business. Before Chainlink, Sergey had a different business that was obviously Bitcoin focused. I don't know if registering smartcontract.com in 2008 makes you Satoshi, but it does mean you're at ground zero. When interviewed, Sergey will say he first got into Bitcoin in 2011, which is still pretty early, uh, but it's a convenient alibi if you were Satoshi, because that's when Satoshi stopped communicating. If they were going to kill the pseudonym and go back to normal life, well, then that would be around the time to do it. Here's a clip uh, from an interview with Alex Mashinsky. 
And I'm see after after seven years of developing smart contracts and ten years in the well, ten years, well, a, a number of years. In in any case, a number of years in 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 in, in the blockchain industry, you 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 basically see. Um, You're People misspeak all the time, but to me, it really seems like he admitted to something and then wished he didn't. If you're a Satoshi hunter, you already know this, but Satoshi was very controlled in what they revealed about themselves. Old Bitcoin developer Laszlo uh, has told us, he or she or whoever it was never told me anything personal. I asked a few questions, but he always dodged them. Those questions never got answered. Satoshi also didn't explain some of the coding choices they made as well, basically saying, yeah, I've showed it to people and, and trust that this is the best. Despite listing their home as Japan, I have never met someone who actually thinks Satoshi is from Japan or that their name is actually Satoshi Nakamoto. The amount of work that went into keeping their email private, their interests private, their location unknown. Even when people have looked at the metadata in the Bitcoin white paper PDFs, the time zones are inconsistent, meaning that Satoshi was moving through different time zones or the Windows clock was manipulated to throw people off. I mean, it, it's just insane. So it feels a little silly to bring this next thing up, but I have to do it. Sergei Nazarov, Satoshi Nakamoto. It's almost too obvious, but if you're picking a pseudonym, you gotta start somewhere. And maybe that's exactly what happened. Michael K at Cointelegraph writes that in the early version of Bitcoin, Bitcoin 0.1, an IP address used by Satoshi, uh, was hidden inside the data. Before you freak out, this isn't actually Satoshi's IP address. It's a Russian proxy service. Could have been used by a bunch of people. But when looking for other postings with this same IP, we find someone writing reviews for hotels in Vietnam. That user's name Sergey. There are a lot of Sergeys out there, but it's pretty crazy that around the same time Satoshi was using this service, someone else was also using it who happened to be named Sergey. One of the reviews detailed a Christmas cruise, talking about the conditions of the boat, the activities on board, and the places they went. Now, if our Sergey had a picture floating around out there showing him visiting Estonia, well, that might be evidence that our Sergey and this Sergey are one and the same. It's wild to me that Satoshi did all this work, came up with an innovation, and instead of trying to make money off of it, they released it into the wild and then left. Would people have held it against Satoshi if they pre-mined a few Bitcoin at the beginning for the sake of experimenting? Probably not, but they didn't do that. They followed the rules. Any Bitcoin that Satoshi ever mined was earned following the same rules as everyone else. And amazingly, they haven't cashed out and used that great wealth they created. That restraint is not typical, that self-control. To be sitting on a giant stack of money means that this person is content with their current quality of life. They don't feel the need to buy a Lambo, own vacation homes, and have a butler. So with that in mind, listen to this account by Coindesk writer Andrew Leonard when they had a meeting with Mr. Nazarov. He's not the kind of guy who ever wants to waste precious time thinking about what he should wear that day. There's no marginal utility, he says, to devoting any brain power to questions of fashion. 
Years ago, he decided that he likes the comfort and styling of plaid shirts. So now he has a closet full of them. It's the same thing with the shoes, he says, pointing down at a pair of newish looking Brooks Adrenaline GTX sneakers. After doing extensive research, Nazarov concluded that the GTX was the best shoe for ensuring the overall health of his feet. He's now on his eighth consecutive pair. Sergey wears like the same stuff every single day. The memes kind of point this out. So maybe it's insane to only wear one pair of shoes for life, but it does give some insight into the way Sergey thinks. Logical, pragmatic, different, quirky in the way that some people are. Satoshi candidates out there are so vocal in their opinions, it seems impossible that they could keep the stoic calm Satoshi showed for two to three years. Sergey fits the profile with his intelligent, polite, and humble demeanor to stay out of drama and to stay focused solely on work. In one of Satoshi's last statements, uh, in an email to Gavin Andresen, they said, I wish you wouldn't keep talking about me as a mysterious, shadowy figure. The press just turns that into a pirate currency angle. Maybe instead, make it about the open source project and give credit to your dev contributors. It helps motivate them. According to a piece by Chain Bulletin that came out just this past November, researchers did some more analysis of Satoshi's posting and the times it occurred. Now, I've seen a million write-ups about the posting times with conclusions all over the place, so that part was not really compelling to me. But what was interesting, that I had not heard before, was with regards to the London Times newspaper. People may already know this, but in the first block of the Bitcoin blockchain, Satoshi placed a message, some text, the Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. This was a newspaper headline from the Times in London that morning. They found that international versions of the newspaper had different formats and emphasized different stories, meaning that this London headline was not shown all around the world. They all have different front pages. Also, the online version did feature the story, but the headline was worded differently. So Satoshi didn't just do a web search that day, they somehow must have seen a physical copy of that newspaper. At this time, Sergey would have been at NYU. In fact, if we really start to look at his LinkedIn page, it makes it more difficult to see how Sergey could have been behind the Satoshi username. Now, before any Link Marines start coming after me and jumping down my throat, this is just my opinion based on what's in front of me. After the first Bitcoin price spike to $30 in June 2011, QED Capital turns its attention towards cryptocurrency research and mining. That seems to be when Sergey pivoted his work and started thinking, how can my business work with Bitcoin? I just don't see Satoshi fixating on that $30 price point. I mean, for Satoshi, getting one other person to mine, getting any value above zero would have been the success point. You might argue that Satoshi could have been developing Bitcoin during an internship at First Mark Capital, you know, doing research and pitches for different investments, but I just don't see it. It does appear that Satoshi could have been a younger person, but if we do the math, that puts Sergey at what, 1920 when releasing Bitcoin? And if we take Satoshi at their word that they were working on Bitcoin for a few years prior to that, then we're talking Sergey being 17 and 18. Teenagers are capable of great things, but I see it almost impossible that Sergey could have done all of this planning in creating the identity, creating Bitcoin, all while just finishing high school. 
It would take a lot of planning at that age. On December 8th, 2010, Satoshi was in the thick of Bitcoin troubleshooting and was having these in-depth discussions with people. One of these messages here took place at the exact same time as this New York gaming meetup. Why did I stumble upon an event from a decade ago? Well, if you go deep on Sergey's Twitter, you find that he was there. He attended this meetup. There is no way, even if he had his phone out, that he would be doing Bitcoin work while at this social event. a decoy, maybe. It's tough because if Satoshi is this genius, I guess you could plant these alibis with your work and with your social life. But the more realistic explanation is that Sergey was not the one posting a Satoshi that day. I do think it's an interesting coincidence, or it appears, that Sergey or a Sergey and Satoshi used the same proxy service but I imagine the list of people who have used that is very long. Using a Russian service makes sense if you're Russian, but it's easy to see why someone might use that who's living outside of that country. One of the things Edward Snowden revealed is that countries have been making these agreements with each other to spy on each other's citizens and then share the info. That was their way of technically not breaking laws. So if Satoshi wanted to make it difficult for the powers that be to identify them, using a service that is based in a rival country, kept out of these agreements, might make sense. Russia is not included in this Five Eyes Agreement, the Nine Eyes Agreement, or the Fourteen Eyes Agreement. There's some smoke to the theory that Sergei could be Satoshi, but no fire. He's an interesting guy, clearly connected, but I'm not gonna say he's Satoshi. Despite some of the narratives that Sergei is this genius mastermind, I think a lot of that comes from people who hold Link. Link holders trying to pump the price of their token. Wouldn't every altcoin love to say that Satoshi started their project? Satoshi is fun to talk about, you know, in a meta way. Talking about the story of Satoshi is a great way to get people interested in Bitcoin. For a project that needs community and needs people involved, having a great story, a great hook, is a way to get them first interested. But you can go too far. I go too far in hyping them up sometimes and I can definitely go overboard treating them like this great figure. So in keeping with Satoshi's request to Gavin to stop treating them like this mysterious figure and to give credit to the actual people working on Bitcoin today, that's how we'll end it today. Thanks for watching.